Hi guys. Hi. <laughs> Sorry we're interrupting you during lunch. I don't know what kind of event organizer would put a, a, a talk during lunchtime, but you know, <laughs> we're still gonna bother you. Bother you. Um, wanted to keep it relatively casual because we have a pretty long session here, right? 90 minutes. Um, so we're gonna quick do a quick round of intros to all friends here. Um, work together a lot, huh? Yeah. And Alexi is actually my partner as well, so. Um, I'll start with myself and then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to each of our panelists. Uh, but you know, I want to I want to keep this a little bit more interactive, given the length, and you know, beyond just investing and funding, which I'm sure is a big topic in your mind in general. We we're happy to answer any kind of advice or questions you may have. You know, Rice and I especially have been advising for many years now, mm -hmm. right, um, in this space. So very happy to share any thoughts or questions you may have. We may actually ask you some questions as well. To, to see what you're interested in, so we can gear our topics toward that as well. So my name is Jay. Um, I don't think a lot of you here know me. I, I can't really recognize a lot of faces, but um, interesting. Um, I, uh, I built the, I don't know if you know a company called McKinsey. Interestingly, actually, uh, Rise came from McKinsey too, a long time ago. Uh, we're one of a, a major consulting advisory firm. Uh, they didn't have a gaming practice back then when Rise was there. No. And uh, I, I joined uh, about, 2005, you know, back in, it was almost 13, 14 years ago, and, and went and built the gaming practice for McKinsey and have been a, a, an advisor in the space, uh, you know, advising anywhere from large, you know, multi-country, uh, multi-billion dollar, you know, corporate clients to actually small developers, a lot of them actually based in Seattle as well. Uh, very passionate, lifelong gamer, you know, always think about gaming, you know, I think Rice would know that uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about the industry and the health of the industry. Uh, and trends in industry, and that's what, what I do as a living, for a living. Recently, um, if you have heard of Makers Fund, uh, you know, about two years ago, or 18 months ago, decided that I want to actually do a little bit more for the industry, rather than just be an advisor, I would like to be more of a principal as well. Uh, managed to leverage some of my connections back when I was at McKinsey to actually put together um, a Makers Fund, which is a, an interactive entertainment focused fund uh, that invest in equity, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about equity versus project. Uh, and so far, I think, you know, in Knockwood and all that, lucky us, uh, you know, and, you know, fortunate to be in this position, I think we are one of the largest uh, interactive entertainment focus fund currently in the world. So, so that, that's, um, that's good. We're trying to, you know, be responsible for it and, and really help the industry while, while we can, right? Uh, so that's my background. Um, uh, I will actually... Shift to Alexi a little bit, you know, because, uh, you know, we, we also have a sister fund called Calvin. We're not trying to toot our own horns here, but uh, why don't, Alexi, you want to talk a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I can introduce myself. So uh, I'm Alexi. Uh, with Jay, I co-founded Calvin Knights, which is a, a project funding fund. We started uh, in October last year. We haven't publicly announced uh, very much, but I think it's coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 10 years now. I started at Ubisoft in Europe. Uh, they moved to Montreal to, be, to work at a big studio there, uh, and then... Uh, Rise actually brought me to, to the US. Good or bad, I don't know, but he, he brought me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think generally uh, So I worked for Rise at Xbox for, for a few years. I was, uh, and with Chris, who was here earlier, uh, I was one, I helped with Rise and Chris uh, yeah. build ID. I uh, worked on a number of independent titles there. Um, and then uh, spent a couple years at Tencent also after that. Uh, spending my time between the US and China, uh, helping build Wii Game and a bunch of other things. And then, uh, for a while, Jay and I had been talking about doing something together. We've been good friends. Uh, I, I admire him very much, and we've decided that um, there's something that was miss missing in the industry, which is a, a team that's dedicated to really just fund projects. We think that the function of uh, publishing and, and investing don't have always to be coupled. I think for a historical reason, they always have been together. Uh, but I think the industry has changed a lot over the past few years, and we're seeing more and more teams who uh, may want to self-publish and are just looking for funding. And so we've kind of started building this fund together and uh, came, came to life in October and uh, yeah, we'll be communicating more in the next yeah, few before, weeks. How many of you have heard of Kowloon Knights in this room? Oh good. That's not bad. Really crazy. Crazy. That's That's good. Good. Awesome. Now, now you leave here having heard of it now. <laughs> it's going to be 100% by the end. Yeah. All right, Ilya, why don't you, you know, uh, explain? Okay, you know. several words about me. I start, I'm not from like consulting business or uh, from a big US company. I start making games like in 2000 from the board games and create the biggest publisher of board games in Russia and next few countries. After it, I work also with Ubisoft on Heroes of Might and Magic 5 
uh, franchise and develop game. And like seven years ago, come to mail.ru, it's the biggest internet company in Russia. We have made not only games, but also like social networks, like Tencent in China, mm -hmm. mail.ru, the yeah. same company in Russia. And like a year ago, we decided to dedicate like 100 million dollars to our corporate venture fund to invest in video games company in different stages, starting from seed up to consolidate 100% of the business. We already make several like, good, good deals um, about games. We acquire Pixonic. It's one of the biggest Russian independent mobile developer. Uh, they develop War Robots. It's one of our successful titles at this moment. We acquire another studio like Beat Games. It's also based in Russia. Uh, they develop very good RPG. And we make a lot of other investments. We doesn't announce it because I prefer to announce the deal after we achieve some numbers in the studio. If the studio achieves like 10 or 20 million annual revenue after it, we prefer to announce the deal. Before it, we prefer to invest money. In our philosophy, we invest not only money, but access to all our technologies, like analytic tools, server technology, client technology, and a lot of stuff. Uh, we don't want to merge all companies in one big group. We provide a lot of possibilities for developers to be I don't know, to create separate like Zynga, Glue, or in any other companies in mail.re group families. And in this case, we provide like money, technologies, marketing support, access to outsource in Russia or like in Eastern Europe with the good prices. And yes, now we have like more than 20 studios in portfolio and plan to continue to invest a lot in companies in different parts of the world. Europe, US, it doesn't matter because gaming industry is totally international in our opinion, and we mostly operate games worldwide on all platforms like PC, console, mobile, mostly free-to-play, frankly, not premium titles. But premium titles will also launch first of our game in next month, and it's also interesting for us. Okay, cool. Did they get an intro from you already earlier, or do you want to talk I, a little I bit more? I really didn't like formally talk because okay. I try to avoid talking. Come so on, much about my come on, come on, come on! Give um, us, the, give us the real deal. Second bite at the app. So I'm sorry, guys, you get to hear from me again. Um, but uh, my name is Raj Dekel, and uh, I've been in the industry about 15 years. And before before the industry, I was at uh, a consulting practice known as McKinsey, which uh, Jay mentioned. Uh, and uh, I didn't just work in video games there. I didn't do any work in video games there, but I did a broad section of stuff from pharma to retail to finance, um, and it taught me a lot about business. I really enjoyed my time, and I enjoyed being an advisor to companies. Um, they were always large companies, and, uh, and I think when I got into the video game space, um, you know, I started with Xbox, and, um, and doing large parts of biz dev for Microsoft Studios, and I dealt with a lot of developers. It was my job to get to know all the developers in the world and take them out to dinner and schmooze them and make sure that they knew me, and if they wanted to make a game, they would pitch my team. And, you know, Alexi was like a, my right-hand guy. He was like a critical guy. Um, did a ton of work for Xbox. It was really fruitful. Um, but, you know, in the course of talking to developers, they would tell me about their business and their problems, and I was always thinking, you know, like, where's all the good advice? Like, who gives you guys advice about what to do? Um, and so it was always something that I, I wish I could take my publisher cap off and all my associated interests as a publisher and just give them mm -hmm. some real truth mm -hmm. uh, and some real advice. And so one day, you know, everything kind of just came together for me. And about three years ago, I left Microsoft and I started Strategic Alternatives, which is my current strategy consulting and acquisition advisory practice. And we have about 20 clients around the world, my partner Bob Wallace and I. Bob's been doing this longer than me. He's been doing it for about 20 years, all in retirement. Um, and, uh, and it's been great, you know, because for the first time, I'm really unfettered. I don't have a fixed interest. Uh, and I get to, and even if they're not clients, I get to talk to lots of developers, hear their business problems, and it's interesting, right? When you yeah. hear it all, and you, you're in that flow of all everybody's problems, they're all, they bucket into very similar problems. But and yes. so once you start advising them, it, yeah. you know, it, it becomes kind of easier and easier to try to understand and diagnose yeah. uh, everybody's issues. And, yeah. Um, so I enjoy the work, and, uh, and we help with investments and acquisitions, of course. So 
Uh, I'm happy to be on the panel with these yeah. guys today. They're, they're some of the best, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I mean, so, so much McKinsey <laughs> talks here, you know, know the right? issues, put the issues in buckets and all that. It's so true. <laughs> so Stru- really structure, structure the problem. problem and all, yeah. like in some of the buckets, I like that. Um, before we actually start, you know, and you, yeah, please feel free to continue to eat. Uh, I, I'm just curious of the audience sort of mix, right? Um, maybe I'll, I'll throw a couple of questions and, you know, raise your hands if you're one of them. Um, how many of you are developers here? Pretty much uh, quite a lot. And, and some of you guys are not developer. Uh, is there any that are a publisher role? Well, there's actually right. some publishers. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. And what about like not a publisher and not a developer? Huh. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Well, what are you doing, by the way? He's an investor. Oh, he's an investor. Okay. Do okay. we have another just, chair? Just a, what about in the polls? Oh, yeah, they are some. Okay, okay. Yeah. Are, there all, are there any company that service developers here? Tools. Oh, they're awesome. Okay, interesting. Good. Ah, interesting. What, what about platform? Yeah, so mobile focused, PC focused, PC focused. Okay. Okay. Mobile focused. Interesting. <laughs> this is what? a lot. What? What, VR? <laughs> yeah. AR? VR? What? what? What are the rest of you what guys What are the do? rest of you guys doing? <laughs> oh, console focused. Nah, it's the same as PC almost. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow, I think okay. the things. Um, reaction to that. Oh, look at this, look at this, look at this. Oh, wow. do we have PlayStation and Xbox ones here? Okay. Yeah, 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 you know. Wow. Uh, there are some people who didn't raise their hands, so I'm curious, like, is it not PC? Not PC and not mobile. I was eating, sorry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> see. That's the thing. So we have a little bit more PC developers than mobile, right? Almost, almost half and half, though. Okay, let me another question. How many of you are self-funded if you're making a game? Holy moly. Oh, man. Wow. Right. How many of you are a publisher or someone else funded? There's a few. Okay, there's a few. How many of you are making your first game? There are a couple. More than your first game. Okay, that's uh, people are eating. It's like kind of a split. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of a split here. I've got a couple more questions. Yeah. How many of you have studios under 10 people? That's most of you. Okay, wow, wow. Well, studio Good. over 10 people. Can you raise your hand just to see if it's... Okay, okay. Interesting. As usual, you're sitting in the back. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you makes a game uh, working guys. with a larger studio, like an outsourcer or you know, other people's IP? Like, not your own game. Oh, there are a couple. How many of you are working on your own game and your own IP? You're all right. Okay, very Good. cool. Very cool. Very cool. Well, interesting. How many of you kind of wonder on the day-to-day basis, how do I ever, like, get, get funding out of this, you know, self-funded cycle? Yeah, it's quite a, quite a lot of them. Terrific. Great. Okay, so we could probably cater our talk a little bit, you know. I actually want to start with Alexi a little bit, if you don't mind, right? You know, you, you, how many developers have you talked to in the last, like, 12 months? You know? I think since, since we started the fund, uh, 360. 360 and developers, that's, right? That's, again, not, not being publicly announced. So it's mostly our network of friends and then friends of friends. Um, I think one of the things that we, we really try to do is, um, one, have a really quick process. Um, if we find a project that, we, that we're interested in, we signal it very quickly. Uh, I think we have a timeline of about two weeks yeah. to say yes or no for everything. Yeah. Um, but also a lot of developers that actually we, we ended up not signing yeah. um, were really gracious and introduced their friends. Um, typically when we travel to a city, yeah. we would go see a few developers that we, that we know already and they'll say, oh, you know what, there's all those guys you should see while you're in town. And so yeah. a trip for, to Montreal for two days ends up staying yeah. Yeah. 15 days because there's just a lot of people to see. So yeah, yeah. we're... I'm going to skip to the tougher question now because I think it's more relevant. So I know we only signed like roughly nine games out of the 360, right? You know? that's, that's correct. So like for the, the 351 that we didn't sign, like, what, what kind of advice would you give to people who are, have a game who's trying to get a publisher sign or get funding, but you know, what are places that they should try and approach right, to, to get it going? You know, you know it's, it's a tough question because I would say the vast majority of the things we see are good. I think that's, that's the hardest thing for us is because there are things that we passed on, and that, that's probably the majority of games, were actually really competent, quite fun, interesting. Um, we like the team, but then we have to rank what resonates with us the most. And so I think it's just you have to take as many shots as you can. Okay. Um, you never know which publisher, which partner is going to find something that they particularly enjoy or they believe in. 
And so I think trying as many avenues as, we can, as you can is probably best. And you just get better at pitching over time. Yeah. Um, I know it's a very grueling process. Mm -hmm. um, on our end, we try to make it as easy as we possibly can, but we know it's, it's a really difficult okay. thing. And, and you know, it's heartbreaking. Every email I have to write saying we're yeah. unable to fund is just difficult. Yeah. What about you, Elia? How, 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 do, how do you, have you worked with many small developers in the West so far? And yes, we've worked with also with Western developers of course. or like Eastern developers. Uh, we started like a year ago also, and I don't know, we have close to 1,000 companies at this moment in the pipeline and try to talk with them. Of course, the biggest issue is in communications, to understand what developers want, mm -hmm. really. Uh, for most of developers, the biggest issue, they want to develop the game or develop the business. It's mm -hmm. like two different way of the operations. And of course, for us, it's more interesting the company which you want to create some, something in business, not only in game industry. Because if you want to create on the game, you need to go to the publisher and fight like, like a good publisher for your title. But if you want to like raise money from like in equity or project financing, you need to understand for what you spend this money and how you return this money to investors. And for most of developers in different regions, it's the same issues. Like in Russia, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, US, the question is how to create a business model. Mm -hmm. It's a big issue. Yeah. And regular start discussion about show for us not only development plans, but show for us like some documents about how you plan to return the money, uh, how you plan to work with your audience. You know, like you talk a lot about like how you protect your franchise because we're an equity investor, and for us it's very important. If we invest in company, we want to push this company to own the IPs, like developers and a lot of other stuff. Do you invest in equity or project? Equity. Maybe. Equity, right, yes. okay. I think we'll spend a little time. Why, why don't we give it to you? Like, for the audience here who are not like as deep into equity versus project financing, Rise, any, any thoughts around that? Because you must have advised a lot of studios around like taking project versus equity financing. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think in an, I think in an ideal world, it would be great if there was more project financing. I think there are relatively few places to go where you can get project financing that doesn't come from a publisher. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and the thing about project financing is that it's not trying to take your equity right, in the business. It's, uh, of course, compared to equity financing, right, which is trying to get a piece of your business and everything that you make with it. Um, you know, project financing, it stands on the merits of what, what vision you have and what thing that you want to make next. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I just wish, and I think it's, I think that that would be great if there were just more places that you could take it. Yeah. And so I'm glad that you know you made Calhoun Knight. Yeah. Uh, I think hopefully it can prove a model yeah. and we can create more mm -hmm. out there, more Absolutely. alternatives for developers. And so everyone will have more places to go. Um, you know, I wish it was a more developed funding system like in Hollywood. Uh, and I think that's kind of the what vision we're trying that you to had, yeah. what you're trying to do with yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I actually have a lot of thoughts around this topic, but yeah, I'm the moderator, so I'm not going to shut it's up for okay. now. It's okay, you can say something. <laughs> I mean, why don't, you, why don't you say something about equity versus project? I yeah. That would be great. So, has, so, quick question. Has anyone in this room, first of all, has anyone in this room thought about project financing? Right? There are a couple. Project financing, taking money for your project, for your game, maybe about six, seven. Has anyone of you thought about taking equity financing in this room? Actually, there are a couple, actually not as much, you know. Um, for the rest that haven't raised your hand, is it because you already have money for your own game? Um, yes or, or no? Or you just didn't have any financial constraints and have enough money in the bank? <laughs> and we should talk to you. I know, I know, you should be my sugar daddy. There, uh, so I'll talk a little bit in the world of, um, uh, of, uh, of a developer and a lot of time when a developer uh, first go out and try and make a game, of course, you know, Kickstarter is always sort of an option, but you know what? It's getting so difficult nowadays, right? right? And that right. question came up. Uh, Kickstarter is more and more used for, you know, auxiliary boosting of funding where, you know, you already have a main source of financing. You may want to close the gap on your, on your target a little bit and you go to Kickstarter to get a little bit of that. Pre-sales as well. Sometimes there's a lot of these pre-sales going on. Um, but in general, if you need outside financing, you do have a couple of paths you can take. Um, 
One path is what we call project financing. And project financing actually comes in usually in terms of the publisher. Until a couple of years ago, project financing is pretty much, you know, you're just signing with a publisher. And the publisher give you money to make the game. And typically when they give you money, uh, they would take your IP. Now, interestingly, because of the rise of indie publisher, it actually, there's actually a model in between where they give you financing, but they don't take the IP, which is actually quite a good thing in some ways for developers, because you keep your IP uh, for the long run. Um, but they do have a ref share model where you know, they would probably uh, take a good portion of your ref share, right, depending on how much they put up. So that's more a traditional model. Now, that model has been more standard because it, it comes with the publisher usually. Yeah. And it's also, it's, all game, it's also very game by game, right? You know, i.e., I don't need to get my house in order because I'm contractually working with you in a game, right? And I need to deliver the game. And I, if I deliver the game, you help me sell it we share the revenue, right? It's a very, it's a very contractual driven relationship. And that's why a discussion with the publisher, uh, with your game, and even project financing sometime, it's sort of like a bit of a, a splitting the pie, right? You know, how much pie do you get versus I get, right? Although, of course, there's a better way to split it and there's also more, you know, not, not as good ways to split it, right? Now, equity financing comes in a different flavor. And for a lot of you who doesn't uh, understand, you know, or, or may not have thought as much about equity financing, uh, it actually mainly started, um, I don't know if the partial financing really started in the East more than the West. I don't know if you agree with me. Hard to say. It's hard to say though, huh? Was there a lot of like partial financing from the West though before? Well, there was certainly venture. There's always yeah, but I'm talking about like from strategics, I guess. From the uh, strategics, from, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. From the VC side. So, so equity financing is very much the, uh, if you know Silicon Valley and how venture investing works, what happened is they decided that your company has good enough potential, right, especially financial investor, that can say, you know, someday you sell your company, I'm gonna make money when you sell it. So they will give you uh, money for a piece of your company. And there's no project financing on top of it, i.e. they don't really take anything from the game. Now, however, there are strategic equity financing that's in the mix a little bit, which you know, you know a lot of the 10 cents and whatnot, and no audience has 10 cents in it where they would give you like some project finan uh, equity financing, so there's no ref share on the game, but they would may take your rights for the game in China, right? They may have first right of refusal for China, or a, 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 a Korea gaming company may, may, may want to take the rights for Korea or whatnot. Um, but that's also a path that more and more developers are exploring over the last few years. If you rewind like 10, 15 years though, I don't think that was the you know, minor majority way of doing, you know, Investing though. Well, a lot of it, I think a lot of it matures as different distribution platforms were developed. Yeah, I exactly. think pre mobile, when, you, when it was really just PC and then when it was just console, I think it was just, it was different. Yes, right? exactly, exactly. So, yeah. So, and also, by the way, with the rise of mobile, to your point, because a lot of the mobile games are free to play games, yeah. right? Right. Um, and there's a belief that for free to play game, it tends to be when it takes a lot, right? You know, either you either get a blowout hit or you're sort of like in the middle, or it doesn't work, right? You know, because it's a very competitive market for you in the mobile space, that it actually fits equity financing quite well. Because equity financing is, I would assume a lot of company would like fail, but as long as a couple of those become successful, I can make my return. If you imagine people who have invested in Supercell, early days, XL partners, London Venture Partners, yeah. um, they made quite a bit of return. London Partner Project probably made a, you know, close to like you know, 50x to 100x return on the investment, right? So for free to play, like mobile, very competitive space, it sort of makes sense sometimes to, to give them equity financing. Now, reversely, for project financing, financing, you cannot suffer a lot of failures. If you go out and start investing in project financing as an investor, let's say, or publisher, if you do 10 project financing deal and half of them doesn't even come out the door, right. you're, you're gonna get fired, right, you know? It's a, it's a, I think it's like, it's a scale and a timing problem yeah. too. Like you make an investment in the console, if you're developing a console studio and you're investing in it with equity, you're lucky to make a game once every three years. Yeah, exactly. And so you got one shot in a hit-driven industry and all your money is gone. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you invest in a mobile studio back in the early days of mobile, yeah. you're investing yeah. in a company that could make five games yeah. in yeah. the same True. time period. True. And so they have more lottery tickets. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So it depends on the timing a little bit too. So I guess that's true. Um, I, I wonder, um, have any one of you in the audience um, kind of pitched to a publisher or, or investor before? How many of you have pitched before? Good. A okay. bit of pitch yeah. experience out there. Yeah. How do you like uh, your experience pitching? Did, was it successful or not? Uh, yeah. 
It's successful. That's very nice. Was it a mobile or pop PC game? Oh, oh you, you make tools, okay. And you pitched and you got money from uh, equity, right? Yes, yes, yes. Any developer as well out there uh, who pitched to a publisher? That's, uh, it, was it successful? Yeah? And you're making a mobile or PC game? PC console, and you pitched to a traditional publisher? Yeah, okay, and it worked out. Do you like the deal? <laughs> Don't put him on the spot. Yeah, yeah, I put him on the spot. I do. What is the deal? I know, right? You know, he's not on camera, so it's okay. It's okay. No one can see him. <laughs> do you? Um, you know, what? I, I love to like everyone is eating and whatnot. You know, I can have like a lot of questions. I'd rather like open up and say like, what are some of your burning questions day to day as a developer? You must have a lot of burning questions. Who doesn't have a burning question in their mind? You know, every week. Okay, everyone has some. So tell, why don't you share with us some of your burning question today? Existential question, you know, where do I wash my laundry? And all that kind of questions. Yes. <laughs> For all you guys, what's your average turnaround time from starting a conversation, like typical turnaround time to starting a conversation to closing a deal? Great. Uh, so the question is, what's our average turnaround time from liking a deal to closing a deal or starting a conversation? You want to start, uh, Alex? Yeah, so the last three titles that we signed uh, took anywhere between 17 and 26 days from first meeting to signing. And talk about term sheet or talk about long form? Long form. Yeah. So first discussion, meeting with the team and like so. Yeah, so the, the reason why Alexi and I started Calum, the reason why we started Calum Light, it's in now, like it's literally, it's in now like objective principles to sign something as quickly as we can. And we don't want to delay or drag people out. And so I think we've been doing it very successfully, right? You know, two, three week process. Yeah, I don't think that's normal. It's very, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I remember seeing your chart of like the six month M&A, but that's why M&A does But that's M&A. Yeah. I mean, investment is, is a shorter time frame. But yeah, usually, like if you're getting, a, you're getting a financial investor, they can move pretty quickly. If you're getting a strategic, usually yeah. that money's coming from a larger organization that is driven by some form of bureaucracy and controls and approval systems, and this takes time. Yeah. Plus, there's a big legal group. and yeah. So when you add all that in, it's, it's not unusual months. for something to take three months. Yeah. How, how long would it take to... Well, for us, it depends on the deal, depends yeah. on the structure of the company. It can take from two weeks to six months. Of course, okay. the security deal requires due diligence yeah. and a lot of other stuff. Yeah. But because we more or less understand the developers, if you already sign like binding term sheet, long form for us it's like technical work. And if we prepare for the deal, we can close the deal for developer like in two weeks, they yeah. start to receive money. And of course sometimes needed to for most developers in worldwide need to reorganization, prepare for like any like yeah. Equity investment and so on. It's take, sometimes it's not by us. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's because the developer needs to reorganize the structure to be more like clear for a like big. Right. That makes sense. Uh, my experience helping a lot, and I'm sure you have, I'm just looking at all the, all the developers that have helped you do project financing or equity. I think the average, the range is very high. It could go from one month, probably two weeks is actually on the very, very fast side, it's right? To long fast. form. I'd say like at least six weeks is what you, at least six weeks, right? Because if you're dealing with any like larger organization, just getting to the long form would take you like six weeks, right? You know, four to six weeks. So at least minimum of six to eight weeks. On average, you know, three months to four months, you know, or two to three to four months, um, depending on how you define the first starting point, of course, and how aggressively you pursue it. But I've seen deals that takes nine months to close. On the, on the long side, you know, yeah, which is a painful process, by the way, when it's taking process. like six to nine months. Anything that drags out for five, six months become painful, actually, right, yeah. in general. Agreed. Yeah, yeah, but you know, some of the deals we're talking about could be like a, you know, 80 million to 150 million dollar deals, right? And those will take, yeah, like that, half, that's that a will lot take of half a year to, you know, a year to close, right? But it, yeah, I mean, it depends when you're getting the investment, right? Yeah, exactly. So right. like, so, I mean, if you're, if you're getting a seed, if you're getting seed investment, there's less to check out on the diligence side. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times, you don't have a lot going in. Yeah, exactly. Versus, you know, if you're looking for something that really kind of expands, more substantial, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Then, then you're going to you get to getting a lot in due diligence, and they're looking at the business, and they're looking at all your existing contracts and liabilities. Yeah. It's like it takes a long time. By the way, let's. I, I'll follow up that question with with a with a, another question. What, what's our, what's our advice to speed up the process? 
Like if you're locked in a contract negotiating with an M&A or an investment or publishing deal or whatnot down the road, what can, what can developers or, or smaller side do to actually make sure that it's proceeding as quickly as it can, right? You know, any advice from your side? I mean, you uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, well, there's quite a lot. I mean, you'd be surprised how many studios um, don't have any good financial reporting. Um, uh, you know, they do their own bookkeeping, uh, they're checkbook driven, they don't have anything that's laid out in the way of a P&L, a balance sheet, cash flow statement. These yeah, are just I'm obviously I'm basically yeah. stuff that yeah. you need to provide. Uh, and you need to provide it from a reliable third party source that knows accounting. Yeah, but I, like how many of you have a third party accountant? On the books that doesn't they, have to be KPMG, doesn't have to be huge. But we've got one, we've got one, we've got two, we've got three. Right. Wow. But this is part of being prepared for investment in the future or acquisition in the future. It's yeah. not going to happen until all your data is together. And also, you need an organized system for to keep track of all of your contracts, all of all, all the debt, yeah. any liabilities in, that you have. You need to have that in one place. Mm -hmm and organized, so you'd be surprised how many people are like, oh yeah, I saw that around here somewhere, Yeah. right? Uh, that, that really doesn't work well when you're trying to get money. How many of you don't have all your company contracts in one single place, one single locker? Don't have it on one, yeah, there are a couple of it. Don't be shame. don't be shy, you know? You it's okay, know, we so can't, no one can see you. No one can see like, you, <laughs> exactly, I can't see you because the bright lights in my eyes right now. You know. well, any, any thoughts from your side? How do you speed up the process? What, what, the what process are the fastest Don't deal? expect the developers on seed stage, on the seed stage or A stage yeah. can be prepared of to the investments. We, of from our side, prepare a list of documents that they need to prepare. Yeah. We try to sign all terms on terms, internship. Yeah. And in this case, yes, we can support studio of it to prepare all documents, go through the due diligence. Yeah. And frankly, because a lot of developers on the early stage, yeah. because it's, it's yeah. the deal time frame depends on the size of the deal. Of course, totally of course, if of it's course. discussion about like 300, 500,000, we can organize through the loan Similar agreement, point. convertible loan, and some other stuff. Quickly, right? And wait and the company reorganized for, to be fitted to our requirements. Absolutely. But yes, if we sign like term sheet or a convertible loan, we can help the company yeah. and reorganize business in the right yeah. way. Because sometimes, in our personal opinion, in my personal opinion, much more easier to reorganize business from scratch than to try to clean everything in the current company. Yeah. And if it's not a big business, on like early stages, it's easily to reorganize. And in this case, we don't ask to company to be prepared for due diligence. Of course. If we talk about like big deals, like from like several million or more, of course, it's a question about reorganization. Sometimes it can be difficult, depends on the IP rights, yeah. who hold the all IP rights. Yeah. It's also a big issue for developers, not only about accounting. The biggest issue for developers, nobody cares about how to organize IP rights. Because it's not only a question about the name of the game. Oh, yeah. It's also a question about your labor agreements between uh, company and employment, outsourcers, and some other stuff. And you need to concentrate all IP rights in one place. Yeah, in one entity, yes. And nobody cares about it before, I don't know, achieve like several million revenue in a month. I know a lot of big companies that also doesn't care about how to sign all agreements with all employments, yeah. about like all artists, game designers, coders. This is the biggest issue, I think. We should, we should talk more about that, point. interesting. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, could, we, could we also say that um, could, could you go into some explanation of what you mean by convertible and how the mechanics of that work? It's like classical the, convertible loan. We can give, for example, on the seed stage, if we don't want to wait on the company organized in the right way, we can give like convertible loan based on some principle of the future valuation. And company can return for us, for example, loan before we execute, for example, some options to, yeah. for the acquisition, or it can be converted on the future valuation. Yeah. Yeah. On any liquidity events. So, if, frankly, it's yeah. more or less standard, like yeah. convertible yeah. loan. So, for I mean, just just a simple. I mean, if you ever think about equity financing in future, when your company is still small, there's a time when it's faster to get a loan directly. And what what they call a convertible loan is essentially they're borrowing you the money on paper, but that money will be converted into equity when you have a price. So, you know, it, normally I would invest $1 million for a 10% share at the valuation of $10 million, right, for example. But instead of that, I'm going to say, I'm going to give you $1 million as a loan, right? And that, that $1 million will convert into equity 
when you have a price. So if you, someone starts investing in you at a $15 million, $15 million valuation, that $1 million loan I gave you become you know, number of shares, right? It's called convertible debt or a convertible loan. And it's very commonly used for, uh, for smaller companies and startups. Uh, I have an advice, but I'll let Alexi talk about it too. Any thoughts on how you can uh, speed up the process? I would say if, you, uh, if you're in discussion with someone, get, get help on the legal side, on the accounting side, and get people who understand our industry. I think uh, I've had a lot of discussions where uh, the counterpart was maybe um, a lawyer that didn't really understand games and didn't understand the, how things were practiced in the industry. Uh, even just accountants who just yeah. didn't understand how to handle gaming tax credits, loans, and just, yeah. I think it's good if you can't find someone to support you um, when you get to do an investment, also get somebody with baking experience but who understands the industry. I think that's critical. Yeah. And that typically slows down the process quite a bit because you end up discussing provisions that are understood by everybody but that this person on the other side may not understand and may insist and drag out the process. Yeah. And also because he's trying to add value when, where he doesn't really understand. Yeah, I think um, make a fund uh, invest in a lot of early, early stage companies as well. So a lot of the company with investment have nothing but a, a business plan or a prototype or you know maybe a couple of sheets of paper. Same thing, not much to look at. Um, what we find helpful and what can help us speed up our process and you know, I think if you future talk to any publisher or whatnot uh, or, or investors, first you, you kind of need to know, understand a little bit of where they come from as well. You know, do some research around what they are looking for. I think that's important to see whether you know your what you want to do fits what they want as well. Um, secondly, I think um, depending on who you talk to, like if you're talking to, for example, us or Alexi, like being open and upfront and proactive is important. Uh, proactive in terms of communication as well, because sometimes we are loaded with other sort of deals and, and we're busy, right, as investors sometimes. And you guys are busy, everyone's busy. And sometimes it just wasn't, it's not in the priority list and you may need to kind of bump it up a little bit if they don't, don't get, back, get back to you on time. Uh, have a clarity, give them, push, put it on their plate to say, what is your timeline and what are exactly your processes that needs to make the decision? Because a lot of time in larger organization when you're talking to a business development person or whatnot, they may not be the person that makes the decision. A lot of times they are actually just taking information into a larger decision group or a committee where they would then collectively make, make the decision. So understanding that process is also quite important because you would want to know, you know who are the stakeholders, how long does it take to get there, what kind of information is needed for that decision to be made. Um, it's, it's, it's actually quite interesting of, of all the company we've talked to, there are only a couple, I say less than 20% of founders would ask me like, what exactly is your process and what's the timeline on your side, right? And when they ask the question, it's smart, right? Because then I have to tell them, you know, we've got a decision process maybe every two weeks, you know, it's just me and this person making this decision, we need these kind of data to make it, right? A lot of time founders just give everything and say, you know, I'll just wait for you to hear back. They feel like, I, I guess that comes from the fact that because they feel like they're in a lesser position because they're trying to get money, that they don't want to like, you know, push too hard, right? But I, I don't think that's the case. I feel like if you're engaging with someone, whether it's a publisher or investor, you have the right to know also what's really going on, right? You know, because I don't think we do that, but investors and publishers, they give you the dance around a lot. Um, I don't know if you've had that. And the dentist around means they don't really have conviction or, or maybe they're too busy or they're not sure, right? A lot of times, you know, honestly, we're not sure too. And I understand that. But they, you know, they are invested in this world. When they're not sure, they, they, they don't directly go back and say no. And they just put it on the back burner. Yes, and that's yeah. actually a pretty bad practice. But, bad but, practice, but, but what happens is like you're just sitting there waiting to, for it to happen, not sharing what's going on. But the person, the counterpart is like forgotten about you already, right? So I think being proactive to make sure you don't get to dance around too much is actually quite important, you know, in, in this process. I don't know if it's helpful. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any any other other questions? You, any other burning questions well, you guys have? Can I ask yeah. one thing? Then? Yeah, yeah. And tell me what you think. So, in terms of company organization, LLC versus C corp, no. S corp. Do you have thoughts on that? Just on your fund, what you're looking for? We, like, we yeah. If you're if you're seeking investment from you, would you expect? them to already be a C Corp? Yeah, we, we, can, we cannot invest in LLC due to a lot of like tax issue and all that. We could go into a lot of detail. But typically, we need them to set up as a C Corp or S Corp, but not LLC to, to invest in them, right? So right. yeah, I don't know how many in the audience actually know what the structure is and how. I, but, I think yeah. if they set up the company, right? But they, a lot of them may not be the one who set up the company. Right? I think yeah. in general, you're, you know, if you're just starting out, you're probably going to go with the easiest form of organization. You're going to adapt to an LLC. And if you're seeking angel investors, 
they as individuals may actually prefer the LLC uh, as a form of investment. Um, but then once you get to the professional investors, they're going to ask you for shares and equity, and that's going to flip you over to a C corp pretty quickly. Yeah, I think it's a one-time thing you have to do, right? right. You know, if you if you do want to start taking investment from professional organizations, it's very typical that they ask you to switch over. It's a one-time cost, and you know you get it done with, and then you know there you go, right? Yes, yeah. it, this is true, but it it has implications for how you run your business, of course, uh, right. and. Right? Whether you have a board or not, whether you have meeting notes or not, some are required by law. Yeah, to, right? to have all the so, minutes and all that, yeah. But it's mostly for U.S. if I get to market. Yeah, because yeah. for European market, it will see form, it's okay for investors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. a big issue. Yeah. It's U.S., yes. We're talking about U.S. We're talking about US. US. Yeah. 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 Any, any burning questions from the audience? Yes, burning questions. There's a couple of hands, but sorry, we'll get back to you. So, what are the deal breakers for you? Wow. Hey, Alexi. That's, good. That's a great question, by the way. Awesome question. Oh, man. Oh, man. Hey, Alexi, do you want to start? You know, red flags. Wow, man. Oh, man. So sensitive. What's the question? Oh, sorry. The question is what is a red flag or a deal breaker when, on, from an investment side? Right? What do you see to say, oh, my God, I'm not going to touch this, right? You know? Um, I'm just buying time. So this is really, this is really, this applies to us. We, we really decide based on how passionate we are about a project. That's really the number one thing for us. So even if we see things that we don't like, provided that we feel like we can remedy them, we'll try to come up with solutions. So uh, there's a team that we're looking at, just an example, that isn't really good on the back end and networking. We're going to try to pair them with someone to help resolve. Normally, that could be a deal breaker because their game is online and connected, and well, that's problematic. Um, the things that really probably would be a deal breaker for us is just if we feel like the founders are not honest with us and not telling yeah, us what's going so on. That's one. Um, yeah. If we ask for an assessment of the issues that were, we've seen in the game and that needs to be corrected, and the assessment is incorrect, whether you know, accidentally incorrect, that's a problem, but if it's willfully incorrect, that's also mm -hmm. an issue. Um, but I would say, at least for us, is transparency and honesty is kind of the number one thing. If we yeah. feel like, even if we see issues that would normally maybe tell us, hey, you know what, we should move up with this project, I think we're okay spending more time with the team helping them get to a good place and sort of evolve through the process. Uh, but if we feel like the founders are not truthful, then that's an immediate stop to yeah. the conversation. Yeah. What about you, Elliot? Any, any red I flags? Agree, or? Yes, the main question is, it's about well, trust. Yeah. This is the main point for a deal breaker. Yeah. No, it's very difficult to check because before deal, you, you can trust, but the biggest issue about trust after the deal. Uh, if you talk about like deal structure, Sometimes can be deal breaker if the founders choose some like yeah. specific region for us. Yeah. And if choose some disagree, specific agency that region, for region. example, for <laughs> registration. It's also okay, if a US company, yes, you mostly register in the US, but if you talk with European or Asia like companies, uh, sometimes founders decide we I don't know, if rate Europe and European uh, I don't know, like Cyprus, Malta or some like countries yeah. Yeah. don't want to go to this direction. In yeah. this case, yes, for us it can be deal breaker sometimes. Because we prefer to use like English law, and in this case, we need to make the deal in some specific regions where the English law work well. Yeah. We cannot make deal, for example, we doesn't want to make deals, frankly, in like Hong Kong or in Singapore, because sometimes it's very difficult. Yeah. For the global companies, and in this case, yes, we require our requirements mm -hmm. move the holding company to some regions suitable for us. Yeah. Uh, it's like second deal breaker after trust. Trust that's very difficult to check before yeah, the deal. Yeah, this is the yeah. biggest issue. Of course, first of all, we try to check founders. Uh, I don't know how to say in English, try to understand it. Do we have some like, I don't know. Chemistry. Chemistry, or chemistry yeah. yes. Yeah. Relationships yeah. can be, you know, can be like yeah. well in the future or not. Because like I'm already tell, told, we prefer to invest like in the partners because we acquire no than 51%, no more. Yeah. And in this case, we need to live with the founders next, like, I don't know, 20 years. It's like yeah. mariage. It's very difficult. Yeah. To, it's very easy to merge, but very difficult to split. Yeah. This yeah. is the issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about? In terms, of, in terms of what I see, yeah. what, in terms of what I see out there, I think um, one is, one is uh, an incomplete founding team. Um, yeah. Because then you don't really know what you're investing yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and even if you, know, you ha are well credited. So there's really the fundamental. If there's someone who is extremely well known in the industry and he's going out for funding, 
like his pool of potential places to go opens up tremendously. Yeah, you can course. actually go to a traditional angel. You can go to a traditional VC as well, and some of those places will look at you. But um, if you believe that this person is, no, is well-connected and well-respected, that they're going to be able to build a founding team, that's great. But there's still a, quite a degree of risk there. Yeah. Like you want to know who you're investing in as a, fully, as a fully founded team. So that's one. And another is, I think, not really having a good idea of the space that you're trying to go into, not having a hypothesis about yeah. what kind of studio you're going to be. Yeah. There's some studios are more of the, like, the scattershot approach, like I've got five pitches, yeah, that, that's that. which that's is bad breaker. because yeah. you don't believe in anything, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, you'd rather see someone that's got conviction and passion yeah. to chase one particular yeah. direction. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to add three more things, but uh, all of you, what you said is, is really right. And to your point, though, very interestingly, absolutely when a founder has like five direction going, that, that's something that we immediately shy away from. Uh, if they can lay it out in terms of a one, two, three step of how they want to involve the company, fine. But if they want to pers pursue like more than two, three direction at the same time, it's already a big red flag. I'm not saying that it's a complete no right away, but it's typically something that we avoid already. Uh, but to, to, to that point though, uh, makers actually, in the last one year of existence, I've personally seen about 800 deals now. Um, a lot of them we didn't deep dive, right? About 400 we go and went deeper, about 150 we really went deep. Um, there's one thing about founder quality, and it comes back to a little bit around trust, and, but also like this person. So first of all, you want a founder to be, of course, convicted of what he's trying to do and really want to show conviction and want to go at it, right? Want to do it and change the world. Mm -hmm. um, you, you'd be surprised though when you pitch an idea or when you pitch whether it's a company idea or a game idea, how many of that already had uh, an investor or public have seen similar things already? Because, you know, from, from, from your scale, you work on this thing or one, two, three big ideas and it's, you know, taking up all, a lot of your time and thinking. From our side, because we see a lot of momentum, we do see a lot of similar things. And, and each of them are a little different, of course, and everyone's unique, but something that's similar. And here comes the thing. When there are a founder that comes in, and this is maybe it's only my thing, I don't know if it's true for you. Mm -hmm. When he's overly convicted of something and don't ground it on reality, i.e. when I ask you what are your fears and what are your weaknesses or who do you think your competitors are, and, and they give you this runabout answer where you know, we don't really have a competitor or, or whatnot. You know, and you know, what if like, oh, big companies come in and do this or whatever. And they give you a, a completely kind of runabout and say, oh, you don't have to worry about that. That's when I start to worry, right? Because I prefer them to actually give me an honest answer, right? Because either when you say that, either you haven't thought through it or you're just so blindly believing so your idea. Yeah, that, that, that actually, I, yeah, exactly, that, that scares me, right? Because you're right. either too arrogant or you're, you're overconfident about something, right? Because right. who knows, right? Everything can happen, right? You know, when we actually invest in venture, I would assume that a lot of company may fail. It's okay it fails, right? You know, but we learn from it and grow from it. So, so that's one red flag. The red flag is a, a overconfident founder that doesn't see it, you know, has a blind spot on all its weaknesses, right? You know, so that's one. Um, other two like minor like logistical logistical um, sort of like if you guys are founders someday and, and you know want to grow a company a couple of things to be careful of one is cap table uh, if the cap table is, is messed up uh, it's very hard to invest so so cap table is your, your investor table right now you have maybe a hundred percent share maybe it's share between 50 50 with your founder co-founder or whatnot for for venture investing to come in you have to have a cleaner cap table ie the founder needs to still own enough share for, for us to buy into it. If there's a company that already has another company that's you know, with 80% control and the founder only has 20%, you will never be able to raise money into it, right? This is your earlier point when we discussed. Yeah, yeah so, that, that, you just need, so oh, that's, that's why, that that's why equity financing is something that if you don't have experience, you do need to seek help, right? Because it, I have seen a couple of companies, one San Francisco based company in VR recently that has exactly the same issue where they grow really quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to invest in them, but the investor has more than like 60%, 70% share, right? right? No one can invest in it anymore because it's already, when you actually have 70% share that's owned by one other company, you're, without you knowing it, you're a subsidiary of that company, right? 
you know, in, in some ways, right? Because they only use 70%. So that's something that we need to be very careful. The second thing when we invest in like early, especially early stage company or maybe growth stage, is if they have a lot of contract that ties them down. Because if, if I want to invest in your idea, I was hoping that you can grow, right? You know, and if there's a lot of restrictive contract that you have already signed with strategics or, or whatnot, if you're, you're, if you're making a game, the rights already, the Asia rights already given to a certain player or Europe or whatnot, then it makes it hard, that much harder for us to actually invest because we do not believe you have the ultimate freedom, degree of freedom to, to do whatever where you want you know, when the opportunity comes. So that's another thing I would urge like early founders to think through when you're gonna give away rights to your game or certain thing you're making that this will down the road may affect your, your investment opportunity right from the outside, yeah. You know, your, your point that you raised about um, what it's like from this side of the table yeah. is it's, uh, it's a valid one, right? Because anyone who is in the deal making side who sees a lot of deal flow um, and when I was in BizDev and Alexi was in BizDev, like, we saw a lot of pitches. The great thing is there's this seasonality. There's this kind of zeitgeist that yes, happens, right? Yes, yes. And, like, you know, I can point to the times that we saw, uh, we saw a lot of parkour in games and we just knew, oh, someone's going to make, like, a big parkour game. Yeah, better way. I'll ask you. Uh, right? And then about six years ago, we started seeing five, – about five years ago, we started seeing a ton of pitches that – were kind of precursors to Battle Royale, yeah. and we just knew. And so we knew from this deal flow that there's gonna be one or two really successful games with this idea. Yeah. And then we're just kind of picking between all of you guys that pitched that, mm -hmm. right? And then we just kind of put our bets on the most reliable horse to us. Mm -hmm. um, so bear in mind that you, know, you guys do have unique vision and ideas, but it's actually all in a zeitgeist. You're kind of in a current with a bunch of other people that have a similar idea at the same time. We're all sheeps. <laughs> no, well, no, kidding. but it's all popular culture, <laughs> yeah, and we is, get fed by yeah, you know, the media yeah, and movies yeah. and so forth and books. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so that's why things happen like that. Yeah. But just know that you're running alongside a bunch of people that are probably pitching similar things to you, mm. and you have to make yourself look yeah, like absolutely. the best. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Yes? So what stage do you guys really invest in? And how much do you invest in the average? Makers Fund? Uh, you know, Makers Fund is very simple. We, uh, we do a Series A. So typically you would have your first round. If you ever raise equity, your first round money come in typically comes from your friends and family or yourself, right? You know, just get it going, right? You know, these are typically anywhere from, you know, less than a half a million dollar, right? Maybe, you know, 50K to 100K, 200K, you know, just get the horse going. Um, then the, the, your first round, we call it Series A for people who are not familiar with the jargon. Series A is when you actually go out and raise a bigger round, and usually from an institutional investor, so either from a fund or someone. And those rounds usually, you know, it can vary a lot, but ser typical Series A, and correct me if like, everyone has a different view on it, but mm -hmm. our Series A is typically anywhere from investing between one to five million US dollar. So we've gone up to six, seven as well, but it's typically within that range, with a valuation of about like anywhere from 15 to 20 ish kind of valuation. So we're taking Pretty about, up. yeah, yeah, about 10% share if we invest in two million at 10% share is like 20 million, you know, or three at 20, so mm -hmm. that's the range that we invest in. And in fact, I'm, I'm not to like, not to like uh, discourage people here. The gaming industry, by the way, if you look at all the investment in the space, Series A, in fact, your first institutional money in is the toughest. It's by far the most difficult because there's enough angel investor, there's enough friends and uncles that can help you get your business going. But your first round where you're getting a professional investor in, gaming as an industry has been misunderstood for many, many years. And I, I, I feel like everyone in this room should know that very well, right? You know, I think we're finally getting to a stage in the West where you know, more and more professional investors start to look at us and say, there's something here, but I still don't get it, right? You know? And so we're not like Silicon Valley. In Silicon Valley, you can go raise Series A pretty quickly, right? You know? There's something unfair about the industry, by the way, and I can talk, talk on and on end, but I'm not going to skip all of that. When, when some company become more successful in the gaming business, actually when you go and race growth rounds, which is after your Series A or early B, where your company is showing crack, traction already, there's plenty of investors who want, who want to do that. Like regular old right. investors. So if you, if you think about like crossing the bridge to somewhere, the oh, glorious future, you have this like chunk of bridge called Series A, where it's like the, the, death, the death valley, right? You know, everyone just leap down here. And in fact, the, the reason why I actually started Makers Fund is because, you know, when I was at McKinsey, seeing, helping all these developers, not be, seeing them just like plunge into this gap, 
I like, there must be a way we could do something about it, right? You know, and this includes proving that there's a way to invest in it to generate returns so more people from outside the industry will put money in it as well, right? You know, so the fund, you know, maker as a result actually sticks right in that bridge area. Now, we're a small fund, so it's actually hard to still like make an impact. But the idea for the fund is to prove that the model works and ideally in the next three to five years, you know, inspire other people to create these funds. So there's a lot of makers fund out there that would, that would do the same thing, right, for the industry. But you know, to your point, yeah, that's where we invest in. The most critical part, I feel, I feel like, today. So for makers fund, yes. if I can ask you and play moderator for a second. Please. So what do, you expect, what do you expect a studio who is pitching you for, C, for an A round to have by that point versus a seed investment to have developed and have for you? The reason we, I have to answer this question in tandem with uh, what we're doing with Kowloon as well. Yeah. Um, equity into content is still a, a tough choice because the reason is we have to see the company exit or sell to actually see the end of the day. That's just by nature how equity fund works, right? unfortunately, right? Mm -hmm. especially if you're an independent equity fund. So at Series A, to have the conviction that this company is going to exit in, you know, if not in five years, maybe in 10 years, it's a pretty high bar, just right. to be clear, right? You know, so typically, we do have to look at if it's in the content space, they need to have one very experienced founder that we know that they can deliver. They have delivered games before, and they know what they're talking about. Very unique vision, and, and that is very distinct and separate from what we see in general. And three, a vision into the three to five year future, maybe even two to three year future, where I have a unique insight about something that I know I can chase it, and this is why I can get it, right? So a very star-studded team with a, 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 a good track record that exactly knows where, you know, where the market is going and has a very unique vision to deliver it. So it's actually not an easy part. So flip side, we, we talk a little bit about uh, the, the reason why we set up uh, Kowloon in tandem, mm. right, to your point, is because there are many teams out there that, and honestly, I, I feel like Guys, you know, even in the audience, a lot of you guys want to make games. It doesn't, I mean, you may not want to sell to the company, right? This is not something you came in the game industry for, right? You know, if you're in China, maybe you want to sell because everyone is so short term. But in, 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 in the US, in the West, no, right? You know, you want to make a game because you're passionate about gaming. We're all came in it because we're passionate about it. And so you may not want to deal with like all this like investment bullshit, right? You know, and, and so investment in the company bullshit. Sorry, I'm, I'm being more and more exact. But, so the reason why we set up Kowloon Knights is to say there are some awesome creators out there that doesn't care about company. I don't want to sell my company, but I've got this awesome game. We can actually provide project financing to them on a recoup model so I don't lose money. If the game does, does well, we can actually make some money back and, and call it a day, right? You know, and not have to worry about whether the company is sellable or not in 10 years. So that, that's actually working very well in tandem right now. The, the Sorry, way, yes. I mean, the way we look at it is almost, I would say the opposed approach, but we're very product driven. We, we, looked at a, we looked at a game and if we felt that it's something special, almost irrespective of the team, that's what's gonna drive our decision. And I think um, our belief is success can come from anywhere and there's amazing creators who may not be great founders yeah, and exactly. may not have the, the story to, to tell in like the three, five year vision. And so we almost try to Do it obscure the other everything and yes. say, we're gonna look at the product, we're gonna look at what's in front of us and if we believe in it, then we're gonna fund it. And I think that's kind of very complimentary in a way. Yeah. Um, and I think our approach, you know, is gonna, we also hope that there's gonna be more Kowloon long term. Yes. I think that's yes. kind of the intent. If our model works, we wanna see more people doing project financing uh, and offering that as an option to develop. I think that's really important for the industry. Yeah, yeah. So any, any thoughts, sorry, I'm sorry. Mm, basically, we use another way of the investments. Frankly, we understand the game industry, it's not like IT business, and it's really difficult for classical venture fund. Because if we talk about like game business, in general, if a company more or less successful, it's like evergreen business. Then the companies generate like cash positive like P and cash flow, and more or less it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, yes, the founders come to the game industry to make the game. They don't want to sell the company. Yeah. They want to sell the game and some other stuff. Yeah. And in this case, we try to create another way of investments. We invest only in game development on different stages and give the money to the funders only if in the start, for like cash in, uh, to support only game development process. We provide tools, assets, uh, additional marketing support and some other stuff. Only in this case, we invest in a company. 
-hmm. if we no, if the developer requires not only with the money, but the requirement some additional like stuff which we can provide. And in this case, initially we invest like cash in in the company. Yeah. Different stage from C to B, C if you try to compare with classical mutual yeah. funds. Yeah. And doesn't take more than 20%. It doesn't matter the valuation of the company on the early stage. Yeah. Because exchange on this, like for our opinion, on very good terms, we ask the company to take the option to yeah. acquire like additional, like up to 51%. Yeah. This is the main hour difference. Uh, and in this case, yes, we take the options. We doesn't fix the price for the option. We ready to satisfy market valuation in the future, based on the multiple to EBITDA or to revenue, it doesn't matter for us. Uh, because if we talk, if you, no, if developer talk with the public company, our main business is to increase cost of our shares mm -hmm. on the market. And if they acquire high growing, fast growing, like middle growing developer, it's good for us. I we see. don't need to, to resell the company yeah, in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. want to take the like financial consolidation and in this case, we give to developer totally creative freedom. Yeah. We write an SHA for any developer. We cannot push developer in any way. Okay. We take only financial consolidation. And in this way, we try to find like partnership investment deal, I mean, name it, yeah. in this okay. direction. Yeah. Because developers still have creative freedom. It's write it in SHA. Uh, we don't take operation control on the studio. It's also write it in SHA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We take only fund financial consolidation yeah. and we provide... By the way, do you, so you invest about 20% or no more than 20%? Initially, we invest yeah. 20%, like, okay. doesn't matter the valuation. Yeah. But they ultimately want to go to 50%, 51%? Uh, we, want to have, we want to have the right the option, 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 option right? Because, because, you know, if you're yeah, as a listed entity, you do want to consolidate, right, ultimately, right? That's part of the drive, you know? Yeah, no, no. If we take, like, 20%, we don't consolidate. If we company achieve some numbers, yeah. interesting for us, yes, yeah. we... Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just curious what the model is, that's all. Yeah. You know, I, I work with a lot of Asia company back in the days, when you were talking about back in the crazy days in China. You know, they don't care about control as well. If they put money in, we have a list code. You know, if I can consolidate when you can make money, it's good for everybody, right? And, yeah, you know. no, no. We take the control because we need to see the company. I see. We, we, for us, it's, we protect us from, the, like, we cash in in the company. Okay. Cash out, they can take only... Uh, then we execute the option, yeah. and only in this case the founders can take some money from us. Okay. Uh, and on other way, we invest only in the business. Okay. That's okay. all. Okay. Cool. cool. We Thanks try to find like balance between like freedom, investments, equity, yeah. project financing, some other stuff. Interesting. Any thoughts? I mean, yeah. So the thoughts I would have if I'm advising a developer um, client, uh, you know, my standard line on uh, on any sort of investment is to try to procure for yourself as much independence and autonomy as mm. you can. Mm. Uh, and that means, you know, never at any point being uh, unable to control your own fate mm. for someone else who can then obtain majority control. Mm. Um, and so this is not an attack on anyone up here, but just to say that, you know, from a developer's viewpoint, the, one of the most important things you can have is your autonomy. Um, and for the, final, for the final act where you give up your, your majority, your control over your company, um, I usually tell my clients, uh, you know, there's only one price for 51% versus 100%. Mm -hmm. And it's to say, hey, you can buy 51% of my company for 100% of the price, or you can buy 100% of my company for 100% of the price, which do you want? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Largely because sometimes you get yourself into a position where you are now in the, you're in the back seat of a vehicle that you used to drive, uh, and you have no mechanism by which to get your investor to buy the rest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, so yeah. That's, and so that becomes name, a problematic issue. Yeah. yeah, so that becomes a yeah. problematic industry. So what's your choice? Well, you know, maybe I should just leave, right? Um, so, but you're, putting, you're leaving money on the table, too. Yeah. So that's the, that's the thing, you know? I mean, there are so many issues with investment leading to acquisition that you really have to be comfortable with. Yeah, I agree. And in this case, why we try to find like partnership deal? Yes, we try to write in agreements initially. If we need it, we can acquire like up to 100%. Right. But when we start negotiation, we told we want to work with the team next like five, 10 years. If it's not interesting 
yeah. to, to, to founders, that doesn't work with us. Yeah. If you're ready to work with us like five, like, I don't know, 10 years, we write like operation control. Yes, we take like 51%, but we cannot change the CEO or it doesn't take any operation control in the company or a creativity control. Uh, if you want our support, because for example, we find way not to dilute investor, uh, founders from the marketing money. We invest only in development. Marketing money, we provide like marketing share agreement without any interest from our side to support founders, mm -hmm. to protect them from dilution from marketing money, for example, on the mobile platform. Sure. Because on mobile, for mobile studios, it, it, sometimes studios ask like $10 million investments. But really, for the game development, it's need like $1 million. Mm -hmm. All other money, it's only for the marketing. And it's different deal. Yeah. Yes, of course. For us, if developer work with us, we require this. Yes, yeah, sure. Next I think, for five I years think the maybe. audience have other questions. Maybe we can move on. I think on. we can yeah. move on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I see a couple more hands. Like, feel free to ask other questions. What are the burning question you have? Just shout it out. Yes. Or oh, wow, so many. Um, yes. We Yesterday, the LA Games space published their closing announcement uh, saying that they just did not have investment from places, where even though they had success and they had uh, yeah. uh, successful Kickstarter campaigns and everything else was there, uh, but there was no other investment opportunities. Yeah, N never talked to them, so I don't know them too well. Sure, sure. Yeah. But for experimental games. Yeah. No, we, we, uh, we invest, um, so venture investing from a fund's perspective by nature invests in experimental stuff. When we say safe, we don't may, mean like 100%. Usually it's founder coming out that have experience. So safe teams, but, but bold ideas. Because if they're investing in something, I don't think there's a thing as a safe game in the industry. Which, yeah. There's no yeah. such thing there's as no, a safe like, game. Unless you're like a Call of Duty or something, right? You know? We, yeah, we, so we, you, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't want to talk about it super publicly, but like we support one and we, we just give them money in exchange for nothing. Just, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, you yeah, talk about the one support a business yeah. model, yeah. though. But, no, yeah. It's not a business model. No, we get some interest rate on top, but it's okay. Our it's investors just... are not here, so it's okay. But, yeah. like, yeah, we, yeah. Like, we, we believe in it. We think it's necessary. We also pick projects that are very experimental and different, and we. Actually, if you look at Kowloon, someday you'll see some yeah. of our portfolio. I think it's going to come out you know, pretty soon in the next like, issues of certain magazine um, with, with some titles. And you'll see that you know, project financing allows for a lot more experimentation because if we believe there's a recoup model. Like again, if you're combining a company investment that needs to exit at some point and experiment, then it, it, you know, it becomes a little harder, right? Again, someone's raising their hands. Someone's, someone's over there raising their hand. Yeah, for, for a while. Yes. Oh, you're trying to ask a question. I'm sorry. Oh, he's, I'm saying, I thought he was stretching. I'm like, no, no, no. He's, he's asking a question. No, he's, yeah. got some. he's at the mic. Like, he's ready. I was sitting in the back, and I didn't want to yell. Uh, oh, it's okay. It, please. It's, it's also weird. Now, then people can hear my questions. I had yes. two. I lost my page. Um, <laughs> one was someone else brought up back there. The, when you talked about uh, getting excellent middle management, about what size of a company would you look at for, would you see that being a good thing? And then the second was, you talk a lot about funding into studios that they're making things, but what about a work for hire service studio? Yeah, um, good question. And if that's a kind of, where there's maybe not any high value IP, but there is the, the EBITDA, 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 the EBITDA, 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 thank you, the proven ability, and maybe gunning for investment in like one, two, or three years. Okay, so let's take that one by one then. Please yeah. stay there. So the, so, okay. <laughs> you can have a seat. No, 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 it's fine. Can I, do I have so, to keep my arm up? No, you don't have to keep your arm up. All right, so hold it. First question was what? Mad middle management. Middle management. What size so middle do you management, put in middle management? Middle management. Look, there's some inflection points in, in just all company organization. You know, there are the good old days when you're less than 10 and everybody consults each other about everything, right? It seems great. Then it's like the 15 person, like you're, you're kind of a hyper efficient team building smaller games. Uh, and you can still get away with your founders group. When you reach like about 30 people yeah. or so, you're getting at a scale where you can't all yeah. just communicate exactly. everything all the time and be a consensus driven group. You need a leader. You, you need clear delineation, people who own certain parts of the business. Uh, and uh, as such, your founding group, if it's just two of you, you probably are too thin to yeah. take that on. And you're going to have to bring in someone that you can yeah. trust but isn't necessarily your peer with the same amount of stock yeah. or any stock. 
Yeah. Um, and, and that person's gonna, you know, whether it's they're running production or whether they're the CTO or what, you know, whatever they're doing or the studio manager, whatever you call them, you know, they are mature, experienced lead types that are good at managing and dealing with people that can solve problems and, uh, you know, in a creative and flexible yeah. way. Yeah, just to add to that point, um, a small company actually, you know, because communication go in a, in a network fashion, you know, it's a mesh, it's, it's less important. But yeah, as you grow bigger, there's sort of like a rule of eight or whatnot, you could, there are many kind of rules like that. It's, as a, one person, it's hard to manage more than eight person. So if you're like a, if you're getting bigger and you have three, three founders and they all like, you all three talk very closely with each other, each other, you can imagine like each of them can manage anywhere from six to eight people. And so that's why usually when a studio gets 20 to 30 people, you're breaking that rule a little bit, right? Where someone is managing more than 10 people and that just, you know, that just stretches the boundary beyond like what, what, what a person can do effectively, right? You know? So yeah, I agree, like around 30, 25 Definitely typically. Definitely by 30, yeah. and probably before, Maybe again, 20, it depends right? how big the yeah. founding team is. Sometimes the founding team is five very talented people. Yeah, but the, the point here is also that you need to train them up, right? That's it right. takes time to coach them and train them. If you're, if you're looking for it, and I'm gonna hit 30 soon, I may want to bring in someone already so that they can you know, start to pick up the pace as we actually grow there, and not hit that number and say, shoot, I, I need a matter manager to, to scale now, but I now need to hire, and I'm running on a, on a ship right now, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. See, it depends also, like, what it does is it gives you the option to take on a couple of different projects, if you will, or focus on different areas yeah. of the business to have that kind of manage, middle management built in. And you're right, it takes time to train them and get them incorporated in part of the company and everything. But uh, if you have that bandwidth, it allows you to do so much more. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Some, at, at one point also, these, you know, I think most of you may not have a, some, some of you are lucky enough to have a business partner that can run the business. A lot of you actually don't have the benefit of having a, a financial partner, by the way. I think most of you don't have a finance guy. At some point, you will need them. Uh, not, not early, but as you grow, at some point, you need a bit of a more business-minded person. If you don't have that, it usually come earlier. And then later down the road, if you have 30 people, you probably need to have one person that's like literally dedicated to you know, bookkeeping and accounting and whatnot, right? I know those are the boring stuff, but it's actually quite critical, not just to raise money, but to actually run a business. You know? As you see people, a company with 20, 30 people making a lot of money, you know, don't have good bookkeeping, right? They don't really know where the money is at times. And, and then your second question. Oh, yeah, so if, it, if we work for hire. Yeah. looking at a work-for-hire service-based studio yeah. uh, that doesn't necessarily have any standout IP or high-value IP, but yeah. it has sort of a bunch of the other things you were talking about when you're looking for yeah. the enterprise value, mm -hmm. um, like what, what, so, what advice yeah. do you have for them? What advice? What, what uh, advice? Actually, I, I so, you know, it's interesting. So. It's strategic, so we have about 20 clients globally, and so that's our portfolio as we look at it. We're, we, we often, Bob and I often think about our portfolio in the way that a VC might think about their portfolio, or these guys might think about their portfolio. And, and some of it, for us, uh, we invariably see talented studios who are what we would call stuck in a work-for-hire trap. Yeah, and true. often because they came, they, found, they founded themselves right in the midst of the recession, or or you know, and it was difficult to get funding or other work. Uh, and, uh, and so what we try to do is we try to work with them to get them out of that trap. And sometimes it takes a while to do it. But the, but the main point is this. You know, a creative studio makes its own IP. A work for hire studio is working for others. Sometimes they are creative and they develop IP that they subsequently give to whoever they're working for. Um, but the best situation is if you actually are running a successful work for hire situ uh, studio and you dedicate, and the margin that you're making, mm -hmm. you dedicate to a team internally that, is, that only focuses on building your own owned IP in whatever that is. Uh, and that becomes the singular bet that your studio is making. So there's an engine that's producing margin and that margin is going to feed a team that's creating new IP and that hopefully can be your way out. And so that's, that's basically, that's the flywheel you're trying to start. But there's no great valuation. Nobody that I know in the industry will pay a great amount of money for capacity. Yeah. Capacity is worthless. Because uh, capacity is everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's, sometimes it happens if you can go not only for like work for hire, but if you try to create service company and not only do like porting or some 
just work for hire. Yeah. If you start doing some customer support, service support in different way, like localization, customer support, quality assurance, some other stuff, yeah. you can create company like Keywords. And in this yeah. case, this company have very good valuation, sometimes yeah. much more bigger than like publishers. But it's a service company. It's also not work for hire, just work for hire. Oh, okay, so yeah. It's yeah. a good point, but it's also super unusual. And they went public to do it. It's key, key um, work, so, key you know, work, yeah. and it's not something in the United States, you're not going to go public. With a, here. With but a, in Europe, you can yeah, do yeah. this thing. Yeah. And yes. it is an interesting strategy. And in fact, and I, I'm working with it. Awards, no one, but there, there's some companies. others. I'm, I'm working with a studio <laughs> right now that is in a similar position and have similar ambitions. But in the United States, like, it's very difficult to scale up from where, where uh, work for hire is, I guess unless they work their way out. I, I, I say work for hire, but I had been thinking service. So we, we do console ports, and we actually really like doing console ports. You need not only port, you need to provide a lot of yeah. services. So then yeah. you, need to, okay. you need to create business, then publisher can call you every day yeah. for some small thoughts. Maybe not only port, maybe to test something, yeah, to localize okay. something. If, yes, you like need to provide service, yeah. not just But develop. if you're very good at ports, then another strategy could be that you take business into your own hands. Take the margin that you've yes. made, and you go to a game that you think should be on a, another platform and say, hey, it, let yeah. me pay for that. Yeah. I'll pay you no minimum guarantee. We'll do the work, and we'll split the revenue 50-50. And then try to have passive income coming in, and then build from that. And we've seen that there's, before. There's, I mean, yeah. 4, 4J for Minecraft is a good Absolutely. example. Double, Double 11, 11 in the UK as sure. well. So okay, there. so if we're doing that, also good what message. would be the next step if we're already doing that? If you're already doing that, then are you successful at that? Yeah, but it's still it's small. So it's a small right. margin. We do a small project. We get a little bit, a little bit more, and we're just sort of stair stepping that up as we can. You, you should come talk to me after this. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's good. Good. Good hug. Good hug. You did say stay up here. <laughs> no, no. Good. Thank you for coming. He we means come up here. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're running out of time. Let's take one more question, and we'll uh, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Oh, we're still available here a little bit, so, so yeah. So bringing up the work for hire, it's one of the things which I'm curious you guys as investors and, and looking at things is when someone gets into EPR extensively already investing or a uh, client that don't work for hire for a situation, let's say they were doing what you're doing, comes into IP conflict, not only with assets, but capital flow, things that they, maybe they realize, oh, wow, they did this for us, but we can get a cut of it because they're patent. How have you, um, have you personally dealt with that? How do you look? Look, look at that as a studios or patent conflicts in general when you're starting to evaluate, evaluate a, a studio. Mm. They're, they're rising more and more in these games. Especially patent conflicts. Yeah, it's, it's Comment? Like, sometimes it happens, yes. Are you talking about the specific like, like recent Montreal situation? Yeah. And stuff like that? As investors, um, we haven't really looked at investing in too much outsourcing studio anyways, because we're usually, so one advice is, we usually invest in founders that have started companies afresh. So one thing is, you know, we have seen a lot of comp uh, folks actually leaving larger companies or what they've done before to start something new, and that's where, you know, the, the experience count. Um, as a venture investing, you're not investing in a company that has asset already necessarily. You're actually investing in people that can bring that skill set into something new, right? You know, so we typically look at a company that has not been founded for more than like 18 months to, to two years. So we haven't particularly run into that kind of situation. I don't know from a strategic perspective when they work with like a developer or an outsourced developer and then they get sued by, let's say, you know, one of the you know, publishers that they work with. I don't know how they actually see that. You guys probably have a little bit more experience there, but. I mean, I, I can't say that I've, uh, I have encountered that sort of thing before. Yeah. 
you know, to me, it really, you just have to resolve a case on its merits. Yeah. The, the most important thing is that these are like holes in a boat. You know what I mean? You got to do something about them or it's going to sink you eventually. Um, and so yeah. it's really about can you, can you prove efficiently and effectively that, there, that um, any kind of patent conflict, that you know, there was prior art on your side, that there was no way that this was uh, you know, some sort of breach um, on your part, that you were just working in good faith and thought that you clearly had all rights or whatever. Um, but let's say that it's not clear. And then the, the best thing you can do is try to find some sort of settlement as fast as you yeah. can, get this behind you, and move on. Okay, so you, you look at that because I, I see a lot of broad concepts people fight over are starting to look at in yeah. gaming and looking at, hey, I own this. And I think for smaller developers, that's starting to look very scary because it's, because it's like, you know, not to get a horse. Is that a concept mm. that you can have, you know? I think it has to be. I think it has to be something that's a lot more specific and easier to own than you know, say, side scroller. Because there's everybody makes side scrollers. No one's been attacked. We, you know, it's, it's, as an investor, people do do legal due diligence some, yeah. at the uh, yeah, after yeah. The signing term sheet. If there's material risk that you, you're going to get sued, then it does become a blemish, right? Because as an investor, you do worry, like, but it, I mean, if you're investing in a, like a very well-known creator, right? And he left this like AAA publisher coming out, and they had a lawsuit and whatnot, now you're investing in him. I mean, you do, as an investor, you have to be responsible in thinking like, what is the likelihood that, you know, they get sued in the end, and, and then they, he, this person will lose the lawsuit and have get into trouble, right? So that becomes something that becomes real. But what I'm trying to say is, it has to be fairly high profile, right? You know, because you know, it, it's not like all the time publishers are trying to sue like really small developer or whatnot. They've got busier things to do, right? You know, typically. You usually by the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but, but, but yeah. I, I do agree that like it's uh it's one of the it's almost a a signal of a good of a good problem. Like you're only gonna get sued if, if you're, you're actually six, successful, six, six, yeah. which means you know you're probably starting to get some money back. So that's good, right? That's true. That's true. Well, no, but that's true. That's true. Actually, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, these guys will stay around for uh, for drinks and snacks later on. So please do the talk. Round of applause. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>